This video is kindly sponsored by Audible. I'm sure many of you already know what Audible is, but for those of you who don't, Audible is a provider of a vast library of audiobooks and other spoken word entertainment that can be accessed by members in a number of different ways. And as listeners to a channel devoted to naval history, you'll be glad to know there are a large variety of titles relevant to your interests which are being displayed on the screen right now. Everything from Japanese Destroyer Captain to the superlative Neptune's Inferno by James D. Hornfisher. And before you think I've picked purely titles devoted to World War I and World War II, there's also Theodore Roosevelt's Naval War of 1812, and even further back, Medieval Maritime Warfare. There's even a small audio sample over there on the left so you can tell whether or not you like the voice of the narrator. So if you want to try it out for yourself and maybe grab yourself a free audiobook, head on over to audible.com slash drakinafel, or if you're in the US, text drakinafel to 500 500. Whoever thought you'd be able to text my name into the ether and get something for it? Personally, I tend to use Audible as an app downloaded on my phone and hooked into my car's stereo system so I can listen to audiobooks whilst I'm on a long drive, or hooked into headphones to help distract me for when I'm doing housework, but there are many other ways to enjoy the content as well. And with that said, on with the show. Okay, welcome back everybody. This is your Wednesday fix. We are going to be following up on the video on the Zero, and once again, yes, the, no, the, the Zero is not in fact a ship, but it did launch from ships, and thus makes it an integral part of naval technology for the Second World War. And once again, I'm joined very kindly by Justin, who helped with the, well, I say helped, pretty much did most of the content for <laughs> the last Zero video. Um, so hopefully you'll be familiar with him. If not, I'd suggest going back and watching that video first, uh, obviously. And of course, I am Drakinafel, which, yeah, I, I would hope that someone who's watching the channel would give guest by now. But you never know. Um, so this video was prompted by a couple of comments to the previous Zero video, where there was suggestions made that the Zero was in fact a copy with links provided to uh, the good old Wikipedia, um, which has variable quality, but whether or not this particular entry in the Wikipedia article is accurate is basically what we're going to be discussing today. So again, uh, welcome to Justin. And I guess well, let's lead in with the obvious question, the elephant in the room, was the zero actually a copy? All right, well, I'm glad to be back. And um, this is one of those questions that comes up over and over again with Japanese aviation. Um, I'm going to cover it as briefly as possible. Originally, this was just going to be a quick dry dock you know, insert. Um, and then when I started writing it, I realized that maybe I should address this probably more holistically than anyone's ever done in one place. Um, because just saying no um, is not enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the short answer is no. The, the zero was not a copy based on all the available evidence that we cur currently have. Um, so first, I, I need to stress this topic sits within my exact area of expertise, which is American intelligence assessments of Japanese air and naval power in the interwar years. Um, I focused on American, but British assessments of the period are so similar that they're often lumped together as the Anglo-American assessment. Um, there were subtle differences, but for our purposes, I'll speak to both. Um, and I've read the literature on the, the British side as well. So why does this sit within my study of interwar intelligence assessments? Well, it's because the idea that the Japanese could only copy quote-unquote superior uh, Western technology stretches back further than most people likely understand, um, at least back to the Meiji Restoration Revolution um, in the Western imagination, where, of course, there was a significant amount of truth to the claim as Japan sought to modernize by mass importation of Western technology, know-how, and ideas. Uh, later, this was particularly true regarding Japanese aviation, and that is the realm where the, uh, quote, national characteristic, as they referred to them uh, at the time, of unoriginality persisted for the longest. Um, indeed, to the present day, given the prevalence of such and such World War II Japanese aircraft was a copy um, in popular circles. So I'm going to cover a little bit of background because it's critical for understanding why certain people said certain things at the time. Um, additionally, the main reason why very weak arguments pointing to the Zero being a copy have such sway is simply due to ignorance of Japanese aviation. And keep in mind, I'm not using that as an insult, I'm, I'm using it as the literal definition, as in people really just don't know uh, about the development of Japanese aviation. Fair enough. Well, uh, at that point, I guess the, the if we're talking about the, the Japanese aviation industry as a whole, um, 
we should probably try and understand a little bit about <laughs> how the Japanese aviation industry came about since, uh, as you mentioned, in the 19th century, Japan was doing a kind of a crash course in uh, how to become a, a fully industrialized civilization in the uh, modern understanding of things. Yeah, so I'm going to do this really fast. Like, we're going to be just skipping along the surface here. So mm -hmm. the first thing to understand is that Japan's history with aviation stretched back into the 19th century uh, with balloons, of course. Um, and they showed interest in heavier than air aviation from its earliest days. Um, in other words, by the time the specification to the zero was laid out in 1937, Japan was not new to aviation by any stretch of the imagination. Um, through the 19-teens and 1920s, the Japanese aviation industry depended heavily on Western assistance and license-produced parts and uh, entire aircraft models. Um, that isn't to say there was no Japanese innovation at that time. There was, but the industry was clearly dependent on the West. Uh, as a general trend, with exceptions and overlap, of course, um, in foreign influence over Japanese aviation, the French were dominant through the 19-teens um, and through about half the 1920s on the army side. Uh, the British reached a, a hit a brief apex in the early 1920s uh, on the Navy side in particular. Um, and then the German uh, German influence would start coming in right from 1919. And then by really the late 1920s, it was pretty uh, quite dominant, actually, and into the early 1930s. So that and that that apex, presumably that would correspond with the that the British sending the naval mission over in the 1920s. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the Germans in particular had perhaps the greatest influence. Um, Japanese firms hired renowned German experts such as uh, Richard Vogt, uh, Alexander Baumann, um, the latter of whom Holikoshi spoke very highly, actually Holikoshi, of course, being the lead designer of the Zero, um, and at times worked closely with big German firms such as Junkers and Dornier. Um, this span from the mid-1920s through to the early 1930s was instrumental in Japan developing independence in aircraft design. So. In sharp contrast to the British, who had deliberately locked the Japanese out of much of the design work and know-how as possible um, in an effort to force total dependence on the British aviation industry. So the, the British uh, aviation mission to Japan under Lord Semphill, it wasn't completely altruistic. It was, they had a, basically a stereotype of the Japanese that they couldn't do anything original. Therefore, if we get in on the ground floor with developing their aviation, we would just they would just keep buying British production licenses and be totally dependent on us, and there would be a lot of money to be made. Um, I, wonder, I wonder how much of that was uh, based on their experience of the, the naval side of Japanese technological advancement. Yeah, exactly. Um, is that at this time, this idea was, I mean, I'd say f quite firmly grounded in fact in that I, I think, you know, that obviously they took it perhaps a bit too far because they took, the Japanese have been following very closely the Royal Navy model or other foreign models for all sorts of different things. And therefore, they, they took it one step too far as in they then went, therefore, the Japanese are incapable of innovating. Um, mm -hmm. Where, so there, there's kind of, you could see where this, uh, this is coming from. Um, the Germans, in contrast, worked with the Japanese in a far more open fashion. Um, so, for example, Richard Vogt was hired on at Kawasaki, um, and he designed numerous Japanese aircraft at that firm. However, just saying such and such aircraft was designed by Folk is misleading, because what Folk did is he worked closely with Japanese design teams at Kawasaki during every step of the process, and he taught and transferred the fundamentals of aviation to uh, design to the Japanese while he was working on the planes. Um, so whereas the British would pretty much They'd, uh, the Japanese would either hire a, a British designer or, uh, get, or buy a production license, and the, the British would design the plane and then throw the blueprints to the Japanese and be like, copy this. Um, whereas Vogt would actually work uh, every step of the process with the Japanese and teach them as he went. Um, and this was despite Dornier actually pressuring Vogt to try and withhold too much instruction, but it was something he largely ignored. Um, as one Noteworthy example, Doi Takeo uh, was actually an apprentice engineer under Folk, and he would go on much later to um, famously design the Army's Ki-61, which was another indigenous Japanese fighter. It used a licensed-produced Japanese modified DB-601A engine. Um, and it is often an incorrectly hand-waved as a copy as well, um, just because it looks European. 
it was actually the entire airframe was indigenously Japanese designed. It's just that the guy, the Japanese des uh, lead designer was taught by a German years before. Um, so of course, when he was given a plane to be powered by a German engine, he ended up coming with uh, coming up with a very European looking design because that's how he'd been taught. Um, Folk's influence on Kawasaki was massive and representative of the German experience teaching the Japanese through the 1920s and into the early 1930s. Uh, before Folk, uh, Kawasaki could only produce foreign designs under license with small modifications at times. After Folk, Kawasaki was well on its way to developing full independence in design and manufacture. At Mitsubishi in particular, it was the close work with Junkers on the Type 92 Super Heavy Bomber project, which is like this weird, wacky scheme, um, basically to, for the Ar Japanese army to bomb the Philippines um, from bases on Formosa or Taiwan. Um, and it really helped the firm mature into independence, uh, particularly in the realm of large aircraft design. Um, but there was a lot of knowledge transfer there. Um, and that built off the foundation established earlier in the 1920s by Alexander Bauman, who taught many young and impressionable Mitsubishi engineers, including Hoi Koshi. Um, it's important to note that even by the late 1920s and early 1930s, designs from Japanese companies with, of course, extensive German assistance were among the best in the world. Um, again, this is all really important to drive home because understanding how the Japanese aviation industry developed places the zero in context, um, not as some surprising anomaly that can only be explained as being a copy of a foreign design, but as a natural progression of a broader national effort in aviation stretching back decades. Um, establishing independence in aviation design was a long-standing Japanese government and military policy from the 1920s, which is why even from the very earliest days, the emphasis was on learning and building capability rather than unimaginative copying. Um, I wish I could go into more detail, but the short story is the Japanese aviation industry had achieved independence from Western design years before the Zero's design specifications were even laid out. Uh, again, the Zero wasn't the Japanese Navy's first indigenous fighter design. It wasn't Horikoshi's first indigenous fighter design. I mean, literally the preceding A5M was an indigenous design from Horikoshi and Mitsubishi. And that wasn't their first fighter design either. It was just the first one that was formally adopted by the Navy. Um, and then as an aside, the A4N uh, was the first indigenous fighter design, just a, a simple biplane from Nakajima. And that was that company's last biplane fighter. Um, an excellent survey on the development of Japanese aviation using archival sources across four languages and five nations uh, just came out this year, and I heartily recommend it to anyone interested. Um, it's entitled Wings for the Rising Sun, A Transnational History of Japanese Aviation by Jürgen Milzer. Okay, so it, it sounds to me like, um, yeah, if effectively, to, to say that the Japanese aircraft industry at the time of the Zero's development is is just copying everybody is copying someone else, a foreign influence would effectively be kind of like saying that the development of the space shuttle by NASA was really just a copy of German designs from World War II because Werner von Braun happened to be helping with the Saturn V program. Yeah, exactly. Like, like getting this broader picture of how this developed um, it kind of places these claims, because a lot of these claims, they basically rely on people not really knowing anything about Japanese aviation beyond maybe the zero. Um, yeah. And I suppose right. also when you're talking about the interwar period, the well, naval aviation, but aviation in general is undergoing such a massive renaissance in technology and and capability. It's almost comparable to the in, in naval terms of the 1880s through to the 1900s and a similar kind of fixed time period as well in terms of being a couple of decades that an, an industry that even if it was in theory fully dependent on foreign designers and concepts it, at say 1920 by 1935 the situation will have changed completely because what would be considered completely cutting edge and radical in the 19 in like in the early 1920s let's say a streamlined biplane fighter with fixed landing gear and open cockpit would be considered hopelessly out of date by uh, 1935, 15 years later, much in the same way as, um, I don't know, something like a central battery ironclad would be seen as hilariously outdated by, by the time of the rise of the pre-dreadnoughts. Yeah, exactly. Is the time scale, and this is what I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit into why, part of the reason why foreign observers missed this shift toward independence in Japanese aviation does is 
design is partly because things were moving so fast that they they didn't have time to like intellectually process what was happening. Um, okay. You know, they they had their they had their hands full as far as trying to figure out what to do with these flying matrons, you know, within the world's navies and all of that, as they were rapidly developing, uh, and they already knew everything that was going on internally. Um, but to look at somebody else's aviation that is also rapidly developing, it it's very difficult. Um, and I guess that kind of segues into, I'm going to quickly summarize kind of the Anglo-American view of Japanese air power during the pivotal interwar years. Not all of it, but specifically as it relates to aircraft design. Mm -hmm. um, the most consistent feature of this reporting from military and naval attaches and their assistant attaches for air on the Navy side, from memory, I don't think military attaches got them until quite late, but anyway. Um, Along with open source literature, which is itself is often an important intelligence source, um, was the preconception that the Japanese were incapable of innovating generally and in relation to air aircraft technology in particular. Um, in the realm of aircraft design, there was truth in this stereotype or national characteristic um, through the 1920s in particular. Um, the Japanese sought to rapidly build up their air power with a large amount of foreign assistance uh, through the importing of foreign models, the purchasing of production licenses, and the hiring of foreign experts. This paired with a relatively open environment in which to gather uh, gather intelligence on Japanese air power, and it firmly cemented the view that the Japanese were wholly dependent on the West for aviation. Again, at the time, this was mostly true. Um, some individual reporting was perhaps a bit harsher than warranted, but by and large, assessments were accurate. However, as detailed earlier, even by the late 1920s, the Japanese are starting to move away from dependence on their foreign design. So there's, at that point, they're starting to transition from we're just going to license produce this thing to we're going to hire somebody that at Kawasaki or wherever is going to design a plane that is Japanese, just designed by a German leading a design team. And they would completely break free of the West through the early 1930s. So when you see the last little bits of them adopting foreign aircraft designs, they would take a foreign aircraft design and then they would actually modify it quite extensively uh, for their own purposes. So for example, uh, the D1A was a German, I, and I'm riffing here, I can't remember what the what it was in the German designation, but it was a dive bomb, biplane dive bomber. Mm -hmm. The Navy bought an example of it. And then they re-engined it, they made it fit for carrier service, uh, they did some other modifications to it. Um, so in other words, they were taking a German design, but then they were stapling a whole bunch of different additions to it um, to make it ca uh, capable carrier dive bomber. Um, so you can already, and this is the early 1930s, so you can already see them shifting away. And it is this shift that the Anglo-American intelligence assessments missed. Um, secrecy within Japan gradually increased through the 1930s and was near airtight by the start of the war with China. Uh, one of my favorite things to point out with that is I have like a very detailed catalog of all these sorts of uh, American intelligence uh, or American tours of uh, Jap Japanese naval air stations. And it's like in the 1920s, they're super open and like they're 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 really long and detailed. And then as time goes on, they get like shorter and vaguer, and uh, the person writing it is clearly getting angrier and angrier that they can't see anything. Um, until really by the mid to late 1930s, um, they're they're extremely vague. I found a few cases where it was clear that the attaché was basically just like slightly rewording the same paragraph for multiple stations um, because he was getting such limited access. Uh, but I guess he wanted to send a report back anyway, so it's like. Yeah, the station is, or it's like this naval air station is good. And it's like, okay. Um, <laughs> it's like the, ja the Japanese, the Japanese are, are four limbed creatures who have planes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, uh, so servers had less information to work with, which means that they instead started to fall back on more general open sources like newspaper articles or chance observations or other open source literature. Um, and then this, this was paired with what was now an undisputed fact of Japanese aviation, uh, that they couldn't innovate technologically. Um, so they were just, that was, that is the motif that they really, really cling to. And I don't want to get bogged down in too many examples, but I'll provide at least a few here. So the first one um, is, a 19, is from a 1939 report. So at this point, the Japanese are not only independent of Western designs, but they're already two to three generations into their own aircraft designs. Uh, but this is the gist from the 1939 report. 
The greatest drawback of Japanese aviation was the, quote, total lack, end quote, of adequate design and test facilities. No successful indigenous aircraft was believed to be in military or commercial use. Instead, Japan continued to rely on copies of German, Italian, and American aircraft acquired through production licenses or, quote, outright mimicry, end quote. The government alleg uh, allegedly had provided funds to rectify this situation, but the aviation industry lacked, quote, satisfactory talent, end quote, and therefore was forced to continue rehashing foreign technological advances. Um, a second example from a 1937 report, uh, they quoted a, uh, a, quote, dearth of local inventive ability, end quote, as a major weakness of the Japanese aircraft industry. And then for a third example, um, I've actually put up a, on the, or we will put up on the screen, a, a report on the Zero um, from 1940. Now, more accurate reporting on the actual characteristics of the Zero were around, so don't read into how inaccurate it is. The main point is this. The plane they are describing in this report doesn't exist outside of the American imagination. Yet not only is the report passed on as reliable, but automatically a foreign design, in this case an obscure Fokker pushpole, was identified as the plane that the Japanese had copied. So you could tell, like, this is plain as day because there's literally no evidence to be had here uh, because the plane doesn't exist. So they've created a fictional plane and then still assigned a European design that the Japanese had copied. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the most laughable Examples of this occurred with the Japanese Navy's uh, superlative G3M land-based attack aircraft. Um, it was an indigenous design and an excellent one at that. Uh, you can see Mitsubishi's background with Junkers. Um, it's reflected in the wings. But the fuselage is unlike anything German, and the wings weren't copied. They were just like, again, these guys were trained with, in close cooperation with Junkers. So when they had to set out to design a wing for their, pretty much this is one of their first designs after their cooperation with Junkers. Um, the wings are very Junkers. Uh, the Americans couldn't decide what the bomber was a copy of. Uh, the Junkers 86 was floated. Um, the G3M actually started development before the Junkers 86 and was actually a far better plane. Um, an undefined Heinkel uh, proved quite popular. Uh, inexplicably, a DC-2 and uh, the Lockheed Electra were also thrown out. And then if it wasn't enough, various reports would mix and match. Um, so one report described it as a Heinkel design with ailerons, quote, stolen from Junkers, end quote, uh, again, implying illegal, uh, illegal copying. At no point did anyone stop and wonder if the plane was an indigenous Japanese design. So you've got like at least uh, eight to 12 different combinations of what this is obviously a copy of, and they're all contradicting, and nobody stops to think, hey, maybe it's not a copy. So but basically, they're going around going, ah, oh, the Japanese have a new plane, and the immediate response is to sort of pull out their copy of Jane's fighting aircraft or something and go, ah, right, so so what who, what have they copied this time? Yeah, Without exactly. even bothering to look any further beyond it. <laughs> yeah, I, and, uh, and I'll put up a little snippet from a report um, from an American observer in China where he was watching G3M's bombing from several thousand meters, and at this great distance, he immediately identified them as Heinkel copies with Pratt and Whitney engines manufactured in Germany. Um, it, I mean, it's like we're getting into Mad Libs territory here. <laughs> um, and of course, his eyesight wasn't superhuman. He's just, he's literally just feeding off of a, a preconception that the Japanese couldn't copy. So he sees Japanese bombers and he goes, well, what are they a copy of? Heinkels. Okay. <laughs> um, and this is despite the Japanese parading around uh, a variant of the G3M. Uh, that had been kind of, uh, they'd stripped all the armament out of it and everything like that, and they sent it around the world. And also they captured a G3M in China and flight tested it. And the Japanese were literally breaking aviation records in the late 1930s using indigenous aircraft. And you could see Anglo-American observers twisting themselves into logic pretzels and refusing to come to grips that Japan was designing its own first-rate aircraft. So... Um, such as occurred with the famous kamikaze. No, not kamikazes. Uh, the plane was named kamikaze. It was a prototyped, uh, prototype Mitsubishi Ki-15 reconnaissance aircraft that had been purchased by the Asahi newspaper. Uh, the plane actually broke the flight time world record for a trip from Japan to London in 1937, and it arrived in the UK to great fanfare. Uh, foreign observers marveled at the quality of the construction, particularly the excellent flush riveting. Um, but then immediately zoomed in on the licensed-produced Hamilton standard propeller, 
um, which is true. It had a license produced Hamilton standard propeller. Uh, the plane overall was a completely indigenous design that had just broken a world aviation record and it was sitting in front of Western observers in the middle of the UK. And they missed that point and instead fixated on one element of the aircraft being produced under license. Um, keep in mind, this is 1937. Remember that 1939 report where they're talking about how no successful indigenous aircraft were believed to be in military or commercial use? There was literally one in both military and civilian use, and it had been sitting in UK two years before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That actually reminds me of... Um... You say with people saying that it almost reminds me of uh, another video you did recently with regards to the uh, the siege of Beijing and the Boxer uprising. Mm -hmm. um, and just out of interest, if anyone wants to learn more about that, then uh, pop over to Military History Visualized channel because um, it's on there. It's a it's a very good listen to. But yeah, one of the things I picked up on there was that after the the various combined Western dash European dash everyone else had stormed one of the forts rather than talking about how the, the, the Chinese had resisted them and how hard it had been. The first, the, basically their main comment was, well, yes, we had a really hard time here. That was clearly because a Westerner had designed all the fortifications. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah exactly. The, the... Missing the wood for the trees a little. <laughs> exactly. Um, like by this point, the confirmation bias was so strong that even direct observation or inspections of captured Japanese aircraft in China were not enough to break the assumption that the Japanese couldn't design their own aircraft. There's a tiny handful of exceptions, um, the most notable, and I think it was from Chenault. I could be wrong. It came out of China, though, uh, where they captured an A5M and they mm -hmm. tested it and they're like, this plane's really good. And then explicitly, and this is the only report I saw that finally made this connection. So they listed all the technical characteristics, um, but then they took it a step further and they were like, this plane, almost everything in it is indigenously Japanese designed. The whole plane is Japanese. That means that the Japanese aviation industry is no longer dependent. Like this is the only report that I have found that explicitly said that. Um, mm -hmm. And it got, it got swept under the rug, basically. Like the uh, thing with intelligence reports is that there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, and it can be really easy to pick out the right one and then say, ha, they knew. Um, but the reality is, you know, you get that one report and then you get 40 that are saying the Japanese can't design their own planes. And without mm -hmm. the benefit of hindsight, what do you go with, right? Um, so what's the point of all this? Well, it's because the claims that the Zero was a copy um, are overwhelmingly supported by a body of evidence that essentially adds up to somebody at the, uh, somebody at the time said it was a copy when they saw the Zero. Uh, to a layman that doesn't know better, some famous American aviator or owner of a, an aircraft firm saying it was a copy is like compelling. Mm -hmm. I look at those accounts go and go, oh, so they're saying what dozens of people in opening classified circles were saying about everything Japanese. Um, it, it's completely ordinary for the time, and it's also completely wrong. Uh, it would be more surprising if they didn't say it was a copy, honestly. <laughs> um, so I focus mostly on classified assessments here, but open source assessments were, of course, far worse as a general view, and those would be the ones that, for example, Howard Hughes would have been more exposed to. Um, and predictably, anything that was stereotyped in classified circles was often stereotyped even more among the wider public. Yeah, and I think it bears. I think it bears pointing out here as well that this is not just a, a unique feature to Japanese aviation. It, it features quite heavily across the board in assessments of Japanese technology as a whole. And in in terms of, as you mentioned, people going well, so and so and so from this time said this. Uh, as as I'm sure many many have pointed out just because somebody was around at the time and said something does not in fact in any way shape or form necessarily mean they're correct given that until well after both ships were on the bottom of the ocean every official assessment of the the yamato class said that they were 45,000 ton ships armed with 16 inch guns and but you won't see anyone these days realistically running around claiming that actually, this is all a massive cover-up and the Yamatos were never 70,000-ton ships with 18-inch guns and um, because so-and-so at the time happened to think so. Yeah, exactly. Like, this is a... Basically, this is going to be a crash course in historical 
critical thinking and, and analysis of sources. Mm -hmm. um, so before we dive into the main show here, where I, where I talk through kind of three big examples, I want to get some stuff out of the way quickly. So the accusations that the zero were a copy are so thin that only, a, only one serious re zero reference work in English even bothers to address them. Uh, that being Mike Kesh's uh, book on the zero. He dismisses such notions by saying that we now know, and this was written in the mid-90s, that the zero was an indigenous Japanese design. Um, the new book by Melzer, which is specifically about the development of Japanese aviation industry and what various foreign nations contributed to it, uh, drawing upon extensive archival research, makes no mention of the zero being a copy. Um, so why aren't they discussing it? Well, it's because there's no meaningful evidence to support it and a mountain of evidence against it. So most people in the Anglo-American world can't read or speak Japanese, and the Japanese source material is far away. However, the early development of the Zero is very well documented. The blueprints, the designer memos, the requirements are all available. Um, it isn't some unknowable mystery. Uh, for example, the wing design of the Zero was an evolution of that found on the A5M. We've got like, they went through this wing version, this wing version, and it, it, it changed from the A5M, and then you see it turn into what Zero's wings look like. Before anybody goes off about some kind of conspiracy to conceal the Zero being copy, there's no evidence to suggest the Japanese ever tried to hide foreign technology or uh, assistance in any of their design work. If anything, they were exceptionally open about it and would praise or mention foreign assistance uh, even unprompted. Um, Hori Koshi, for example, openly stated that he studied the um, Vought V143's landing gear before he designed the landing gear for the Zero, because of course uh, retractable landing gear were, were uh, actually new, mostly to Japan at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the Japanese were also very open, for example, um, on the assistance they received in their jet program. Uh, that's a fascinating story in and of itself and another tale that's often hand-waved in English as they copied the Germans, uh, which is really only a fraction of the story and glosses over exactly what was pulled from the Germans and what was J uh, Japanese innovation. Um, it's, you know, it took like 80 years, but Melzer has an excellent chapter on that book. Um, so we finally have something in English in published form that's good. Um, and Kaz is an expert on Japanese jet engine development, and he has a, a few extensively researched articles up online that I'll link in the comments. But that's a case of like even post-war, when, uh, for example, the US Navy technical mission and others were looking at Japanese stuff, we lost a lot of good data because even in 1945-46, they would take one look at something, and if it superficially looked like something else, they would immediately write it off as a copy and be like, we don't need to look at it. Um, so we lost a lot of... <laughs> of useful information um and that and that's without the japanese aviation industry pulling the japanese navy and trying to set fire to everything <laughs> yeah. and sometimes they did so we we have very fragmentary information and even though the americans captured a complete example and we could have had all of this like detailed information about this plane because the Jap uh, the the u.s guy in 1946 or whenever took one look at it it kind of looked like you know a, a uh, an ME 262 or something like that mm -hmm. um, as a random example and they go oh it's a copy and they, they just don't even bother investigating at all <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, it's it was still there even post-war so perhaps the most amusing example of openness um, on about the in foreign influence of design was for the key 43 uh, so it's often mm -hmm. claimed that the copy of the landing gear for uh, that they copied the landing gear from the V143, but then a, a designer involved with the Key 43 project actually stated that they had not copied the V143's landing gear, but in fact the landing gear of a much more obscure Northrop 5D. Um, <laughs> so in other words, he made no effort to conceal that he'd referenced a foreign design, and then he was like, "Oh no, we didn't copy that one. We copied this one." <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like, how, how dare you get the one we copied wrong? <laughs> Um, in fact, the Northrop 5D is so obscure, I was like, what? And I had to like try and Google around and find a picture of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I think the first, the first time anyone hears 5D, they're probably thinking of the F5 Freedom Fighter. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, that, that thing's landing gear in World War II would have been a very impressive feat of time travel. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, if you look at the, the Key 43 One's landing gear, and then you compare it to the V143s, and then the, the Northrop 5Ds, it does look more similar to a 5D's, in my view, than a V143. Hmm. Um, 
So another important point to keep in mind was that the Japanese by the late 1930s were mainly focused on very specific elements of aircraft that were new to them, such as retractable landing gear. Uh, the other big one they had interest in was how engines were fitted to airframes. I don't exactly, and if someone knows more about aircraft design, I'd be curious to know, like they really liked it. Uh, they liked, that's what they liked most about when they got a Heinkel 100, uh, they looked at how the engine was fitted to the airframe. When they got a Fokker Wolf 190, they didn't really care about the whole plane. They just wanted to know how the engine was fitted to the airframe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so they had little interest in entire aircraft for production uh, outside of a handful of exceptions. Uh, the DC-3, for example, was one exception. They had purchased a production license. Uh, the DC-3 was one of the outstanding aircraft of its time, and that's important. The Japanese wanted the best. They weren't falling over themselves for second-rate rejects from the U.S., like, like the V-143 or whatever else. Uh, for the most part, they actually acquired foreign aircraft designs to use as yardsticks to, to check their own work. Um, so the Japanese were independent in aviation design, but they still had that little niggling thing in the back of their heads. It's like, well, we're going to check to make sure we're doing it right. So they, you know, they buy a foreign plane and then test it against their planes and then go, yep, we're doing it right. Mm -hmm. um, so what the Japanese actually thought of those aircraft once they got to Japan is little documented in English, but thankfully Kaz provided me with a bunch of translated material. Uh, the gist is they were hardly overawed by Western aviation. Uh, for example, the Japanese army had purchased Italian VR-20s um, and medium bombers as a stopgap while awaiting delivery of Mitsubishi's Ki-21, and the Japanese army hated them. Uh, one historian of Japanese aviation explained that it developed a reputation among Japanese air crews as a clumsy fire trap. Um, they were relieved when they could phase them out for a homegrown design. And keep in mind that in the mid to late 1930s, the BR-20 was a first-rate medium bomber by European standards. I mean, the Italians all get dunked on a lot, but... Mm. I, the BR-20 entered service in 1936. It was a, it was a good bomber. Um, so that isn't to say the Japanese thought all Western aircraft were bad. That was certainly not the case. But opinions tended to be pretty neutral. Uh, they had respect for the Western aviation industries, uh, but, were, but they weren't struck by dumbfounded awe that is often assumed in the Anglo-American world. That kind of has like a streak of chauvinism to it. Mm. Um, yeah, I suppose that has parallels in the in the naval the naval side as well because yeah again they're not they respect other navies and, and like with the Royal Navy which they they sort of base themselves off they respect the Royal Navy but they're not sort of fawning and falling over every time a ship flying the white ensign shows up in port they're just going right this is clearly the biggest most powerful navy in the world they must be doing something right let us work out what they're doing so that we can do it except even better. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, they could show respect without being like, yeah, yeah hanging on every single, like flipping through magazines to try and mm -hmm. copy the outlines of Western aircraft. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, so just because the Western aviation industries were first rate in developing great planes doesn't mean the Japanese in the mid to late 1930s, one, liked all of what they were seeing out of the West. Um, they were different planes for different nations for different purposes. Or, and two, they, that they immediately assumed that their own aircraft were intrinsically inferior. Uh, the Japanese, too, were putting out first-rate aircraft designs at the time and breaking world records, after all. Uh, they sought to confirm that by acquiring foreign models to test, again, by just checking their own work, um, by just keeping an eye on Western aviation, which is something air powers just do because you don't want to be totally ignorant of what uh, other nations are doing. Um, Probably the most interesting example is the Japanese were actually given an offer by Germany to purchase a production license for the BF-109 in 1939. Um, the popular conception would be the Japanese would be falling over themselves to acquire a first-rate Western aircraft. But amusingly, the first reports to the Japanese army from the military attache attached to the German embassy treated it like a novelty. Um, Japan declined because it was too expensive, even though they said it would have been handy for research, I guess. Um, Keep in mind that isn't them wanting to copy it, they just wanted to test it and compare it to their own designs. Uh, in fact, they later acquired a BF-109 E7 and did just that, it's pictured. Uh, it was tested mm -hmm. against the Ki-27 and then the Ki-60, which we actually have a very ro rare photograph of that competitive flight trial uh, between the Ki-60 and the BF-109. The Ki-60, by the way, was a failed prototype. It was... Um, it looks very similar to a Ki-61 because it was a close, very, very close relation. Um, and most famously, the Ki-44, which was an army interceptor. Um, the Japanese didn't lavish praise on the BF-109. We have their detailed evaluation of it. Uh, and the Ki-44 was actually seemingly assessed to perform equal or better against it. 
again, the Japanese talked about the capabilities of the 109 much in the same way you would see any report. Uh, just kind of pluses and minuses, pretty neutral overall. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, and this was like a first-rate combat aircraft duking it out in the skies over Europe, as opposed to the V-143, for example, which was rejected by the U.S., but by the logic of some, the Japanese were so overawed by it that they wanted to copy it. Zero. Yeah, and yeah, I suppose just yeah, just thinking off the top of my head, if you're looking at BF-109 versus the the indigenous Japanese designs, you yeah, the BF-9 maybe has some slightly greater protective features at that particular time, but at the same time, especially given uh, the BF-109 had fuel issues going across the channel to fight over London, uh, a force that's operating something like the Zero is probably going to look at the BF-109's operational range and go, uh -huh, no, no. Yeah, and like this is, uh, and it was army, it was evaluated by the army, and the, again, like they didn't love it, and they didn't hate mm. it. They were just kind of like, here's the pluses and minuses of the plane. It does this well. Uh, cockpit visibility here could be better. Uh, that kind of thing. Mm. So in other words, you know, the, the preconception would be like, oh, wow, they would have bowed down to their Teutonic overlords. And then it was like, when they actually got a plane, it was more like, well, this is a good plane. We, we have good planes too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so with all that out of the way, we can finally tackle the three big claims. Um, all the context I laid out is important because to consider this whole zero was a copy idea, you have to ignore the entire trajectory of the Japanese aviation industry over a span of decades, what the Japanese used foreign aircraft for and what they were most interested in by the late 1930s, uh, all to rationalize a story about how the Japanese copied rejected Western designs from the UK or US that didn't even see extensive service. Um, one of the most damning elements that undermines arguments that the Zero was a copy is that people can't even decide among themselves what it was a copy of. Mm -hmm. uh, there are multiple contradictory stories about what it was copying, and keep in mind, I'm only going to mention the three most interesting. I've seen people say it was a copy of just all sorts of stuff, probably running at least over a dozen, all told. Um, and not a single piece of hard evidence to support any of it. People just throw out planes that the Zero was a copy of without evidence, and then anyone seeking to debunk them play an endless game of whack-a-mole. Um, just like Anglo-American intelligence assessments of the late 1930s, the people pushing this stuff take it as an article of faith that the Japanese aircraft had to be a copy of something. Um, it's a classic case of bad history. It's a conclusion in search of evidence rather than what it should be, which is evidence informing a conclusion. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to address them kind of in, in the order of most plausible to least plausible. Um, so I'm going to tackle the, the Gloucester F-534 first. Uh, that is because, in my view, it has the strongest case, relatively speaking. And trust me, the word relatively is doing a lot of work because the, the case isn't strong. Uh, put another way, even this case is essentially conspiratorial and wouldn't get a passing grade in an undergraduate history course. <laughs> so the peak of British influence on Japanese naval aviation, which is crucial when we talk about the Gloucester, uh, occurred in 1922 with the conclusion of the British aviation mission to Japan. Now. I, this might be new to some people, but a couple of British spies, uh, Rutland and then Lord Sempill, and Sempill led the aviation mission, would actually pass information to the Japanese beyond that point. Um, but even before Sempill stopped sending info in 1926, which, by the way, the British knew Sempill was doing this, and they had him, they sat him down for a stern talking to in 1926. Um, the Japanese had largely lost interest in what he provided by that point. The designs were not impressive to the Japanese, and then they were later cleared for legal purchase anyway, and the Japanese showed no interest in them. Uh, Japanese naval aviation increasingly turned away from the British toward the Germans and later the Americans, uh, all the while increasing its independence from foreign design into the 1930s. Rutland's impact, interestingly, as an interesting side note, was focused more on the development of Akagi and Kaga. Uh, I haven't been able to like see the, ex the details of exactly what he provided on carrier design, but apparently he was quite useful. Um, yeah, I mean, there, it, there's, a, there's a certain amount of uh, correlation now that you mentioned that between Akagi and Kaga. Um, they, they, yeah, it, at least in their initial formats before the refits, if you compare them to Courageous, Glorious, and to a certain extent Furious, you've got the sort of rounded uh, flight deck. At the bow and multiple tiers of launching aircraft, although they are set, they are they are still different design lineages. But there's a lot more. If you if you looked at a photo of Akagi 
typical cargo in the 1920s and a photo of glorious or courageous in the 1920s you'd spot a lot more similarities between those ships than you would if you put either of them up against say lexington or saratoga yeah definitely it's, a, it's an interesting little point um i guess to expand slightly on the aside mm. uh apparently the format is the japanese would provide rutland with a a large questionnaire and then he would fill out detailed answers to all their questions and send it back uh for money, okay. basically <laughs> yeah um and then rutland in later on would once his technical usefulness ran out the japanese continued paying him for more general espionage. Um, and they, at that point, they really didn't get a return on their investment. And that's kind of what ended up. <laughs> um, so uh, I note Sempil in particular, um, because a new post by Nicholas Millman, which I'll, I'll link, um, who is actually a serious historian of, of Japanese aviation, um, he kind of has a fun post where he speculates that Sempil may have been a possible source of Gloucester F-534 information. But the evidence is thin and heavily circumstantial. Uh, British intelligence carefully tracks Sempil, and the fact that they never threw the book at him uh, indicates that what he was providing, if anything, after 1926 was of limited value. Um, he'd been actually on a blacklist from 1926 for any sensitive information related to aircraft technology or air power. And again, this all relies on the Japanese caring enough about the unproven and later rejected design of the F-5 to copy it from drawings, um, even though the strongest aspect of Japanese aircraft design was the airframe. Uh, the Japanese had little trouble designing excellent airframes. It was engines and propellers that they tended to be behind on. Uh, again, it's the implication that the Japanese were falling, them, uh, falling over themselves for Western designs, second-hand reject ones, no less. When there's ample evidence that the Japanese treated even first-rate or frontline Western fighters like the 109 with more mild curiosity than rabid obsession. I suppose that yeah, I suppose that's the other thing, isn't it? It's like if they're copying, if they're copying designs that are failed rejects in the west then how if if the, if that's the true origin of the zero how does one explain that by the time you get round to actually fighting people in 1941 and 1942 how this supposed inferior copy of an inferior plane is now beating aircraft that the western powers had rated superior and put into production for their own air forces yeah exactly it's it's a very bizarre uh, set of like argument. Hmm. Now, to, to briefly walk through the, the the very tenuous, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try I'm gonna give these as fair a shake as I can, but it, there's so little evidence here. There's very little meat. <laughs> yeah. So the the flimsy connection often drawn is that Gloucester had previously worked with the Japanese on the A1N back in the late 1920s, but this ignores that one Gloucester worked with Nakajima, a rival aircraft firm specifically. Uh, Japan's not a hive mind. Mitsubishi was its own company. And two, the A1N is a tenuous connection to Gloucester because the competition that it won caused great anger and controversy in Japan. Uh, it was a licensed production of a foreign aircraft that didn't meet all of the stated design requirements put out by the Navy. Uh, and yet it beat Mitsubishi's indigenously designed fighter, uh, along with, uh, I think, at least one other entry. Uh, it went against Japan's policy of establishing aviation self-sufficiency, and it ended up delaying Japanese independence in foreign design by several years. So in other words, the A1N wasn't exactly a revered poster child, particularly within Mitsubishi. And then finally, I mean, there were, there were several carrier fighters and other aircraft, including indigenous designs, that entered service in between the A1N and the Zero. So if we remember our short designation, A1N, mm -hmm. A6M. <laughs> um, yeah. Are so we... there was the, yeah, there's the A1N, which is a gloss, I think, uh, Gloucester Gambit um, production copy. Then there was the A2N, which was like a, and I'm riffing off memory here. It was a, it wasn't a copy. It was a combin. It was like a, uh, a Frankenstein's monster of two different American aircraft. A3N inexplicably is a two seat trainer version of the A2N. Uh, the A4N is an indigenous biplane. Uh, and then the A5M, of course, is the, the precursor to the Zero from Mitsubishi. So to put my tinfoil hat on for a moment, the logic of this argument is that Holikoshi, coming off the back of the highly successful preceding indigenous fighter that he had designed, the A5M, elected to go back and copy a foreign design for its successor against Japan's policy of self-sufficiency in aviation and the general trend of the Japanese aviation industry proceed, uh, over the preceding decade. The design selected was an unproven Gloucester prototype that Horikoshi could theoretically have seen in a magazine or some general layout from drawings of the F-534 provided clandestinely by Semphill. Uh, 
Of, clo uh, of course, again, there is no actual evidence supporting either of those scenarios. Gloucester supplied a couple of Japanese planes in the 1920s, uh, with most people focusing on the last Gloucester design, the A1N, which won rival firm Nakajima a fighter competition close to a decade before the Zero's design specification was laid out, uh, defeating Mitsubishi's design Hoikoshi had also worked on. That is why Gloucester, in this argument, was appealing to the Japanese, despite the Japanese showing minimal interest in British, British aviation generally by the mid to late 1930s, being focused mostly on German and American models. Now, there is some superficial resemblance to the Zero, uh, though the wing form and tailplane are different. Uh, the, the resemblance is what gave rise to the whole theory. And to its credit, of the three types I'll talk about, it's the only one to actually look like a Zero. Um, its performance was generally lower all around, and it was not identical in dimensions, but there is a, simu uh, a similarity there. Now, the next, the next case is the V143, uh, which I've already talked about in passing quite a bit. So my, my blurb on the last two aircraft will be shorter simply because their cases are significantly thinner than that for the Gloucester, and anything I said generally about the overall logic of the Zero being a copy in the Gloucester section is relevant for these, and I don't want to repeat. Um, so the first is the Vought V143. Uh, there isn't any evidence to suggest this plane was copied, and it doesn't even look like a Zero. I mean, the wing form is different, the tail plane's different, the fuselage is different. Literally, the only thing in common is that they're both single radial engine fighters. Uh, the whole basis of the case in favor of the V-143 is that Japan bought an example during the late 1930s, uh, buying spree in the U.S., and then when the president of Vought uh, said a zero, uh, said he or saw a zero, he said it was obviously a copy. And I, you know, I can't possibly think of why the president of a company that developed a failed prototype would claim ownership over a highly successful Japanese fighter. Um, again, at a time where there was an extremely strong preconception that the Japanese could only copy. <laughs> like, this is pretty basic uh, critical thinking skills here. So unfortunately for the president of Vought, uh, we know exactly what the Japanese did with the V-143 after they purchased it and what they thought of it. Um, so it got back to Japan after the design specification that would lead to the Zero had already been established. So we're already in farcical territory where the Japanese are retroactively copying a cast-off U.S. design to meet a specification that was already established and sent out to industry. However, what is completely and irrefutably damning is that the Japanese tested Vought's prized aircraft. Um, the conclusion, unsurprisingly, given the U.S. reaction to the prototype in their own evaluation, was that the plane sucked. Sorry. Uh, in fact, the Japanese assessed that it was inferior to the A5M and the Ki-27. So in other words, for this theory to hold up, someone would need to argue Horikoshi copied the B-143 as a successor to the A5M, despite the plane being rated in evaluations by the Japanese as inferior to the A5M. <laughs> um, so what happened to the V-143? Well, after the disappointing tests, Nakajima and Mitsubishi jointly pulled the plane apart and just kind of studied its layout, particularly the retractable landing gear, uh, as mentioned before. Again, Holikoshi stated that he used the knowledge to design the landing gear on the Zero. That's not saying he copied it, because he really couldn't. I mean, the Zero was mm. a carrier aircraft, um, and it was different, so he would have had to modify the landing gear design. But he did reference the V-143. Mm. But with, with, more, with more, more reference to other aircraft as well. Yeah, because he'd, he'd, he'd have to change it, because, of course, the planes weighed differently. They were different sizes, and they were... A uh, carrier, uh, carrier aircraft has to have a stronger landing gear than land-based aircraft generally. Yeah, to withstand the shock of short landing. Mm. Now, the last one is the Hughes H1 Racer. Um, the, the H1 Racer is the strangest, and then it's probably the most commonly thrown out, but it's simultaneously the least plausible of the three. Uh, literally, the only reason I can think of for its prevalence is that Wikipedia prominently talks about this possibility, and as an aside, English language Wikipedia articles on Japanese aircraft generally suck. Um, Zero's page is probably the least bad, but some of them are. So when I asked Kaz, a uh, Japanese expert, about the H1 accusations, he was actually just confused. <laughs> um, unlike the Gloucester or the V143, the Japanese don't talk about the H1 at all. He had no idea what it was and had to look it up. Sorry, Howard Hughes. Mm -hmm. um, the planes don't even look remotely similar. Their cap capability is completely different. And the only evidence is, again, an American saying the Zero was obviously a copy in a time when Americans, particularly in popular circles, said Japanese aircraft were copies. And by the way, I've read several assessments of captured Zeros, and as flawed as some of their conclusions are, no serious analysis that I've read from people that inspected Zeros said it was a copy in whole. Um, so in other words, Hughes is 
either misremembering when he's talking about this or he's just lying because I've read people that have studied the Akuten Zero and et cetera, and they're not saying it's a copy. So, and if they had, trust me, that it would be widely cited in English language literature because so much of the literature is honestly far too dependent on wartime US intelligence reporting on Japanese aviation. Um, it's kind of unfortunate. I mean, imagine if our entire understanding of the P-51 or the, or the Spitfire's history was pieced together from German wartime intelligence reports. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Because that's, kind of, that's the state of the English language understanding for quite a few Japanese aircraft. So the strange story from his then publicist about, quote, Japanese Air Force generals and, quote, being given designs for the plane and, and climbing all over the plane makes little sense, given that there's no such thing as a Japanese Air Force. Uh, and certainly no such thing as Japanese Air Force generals. Uh, Japanese generals would imply army, and the Japanese army and navy barely spoke to each other. The Zero was obviously a navy plane. Uh, and there is no known documentary record to support any of this. It's literally hearsay from Hughes and his PR guy. Now, the Japanese were in fact on a buying spree of U.S. aviation-related material in the late 1930s, uh, but this wasn't like under the table copying of whole designs. It was overwhelmingly focused on purchasing U.S. machine tools, uh, which Japan was heavily dependent on, and then the legal, open, and well-documented purchasing of production licenses for various specific bits of aviation technology. Uh, the first major aeronautical mission to the U.S. was in 1937, led by uh, Colonel Okada Juichiro, of the Japanese Army's Air Technical Research Laboratory. His primary mandate was to examine US production methods and capabilities to expand aircraft production, particularly under wartime conditions. So in other words, there was a clandestine element to his mission, but it was big picture strategic, like how much, how, uh, you know, how do they build their planes and how many planes could they make in a year, particularly under wartime. Uh, yeah, the group might have some relevance if you're planning to go to war with them. <laughs> exactly. Um, and the group had a lot of money. Uh, so this is where they actually picked up the V-143 uh, and the DC-3 production license and also production licenses for various bits and bobs. Um, and their money enabled them to get a very clear picture of the US aviation industry and its methods writ large. So people would kind of maybe assume that, oh, the Japanese just didn't know. Um, the fact is, at least the Japanese intelligence actually had a very clear picture of uh, how, my, uh, how powerful the U.S. aviation industry could be. Um, but intelligence actually factored very little into Japanese strategic um, decision making. And so the, it's highly dubious to say that this intelligence played into um, the Japanese ticking clock element, although it's possible that it did. But it's a bit murky there. Anyway, so it was, it was espionage by checkbook, basically. Um, you, it was kind of a, it's kind of amazing, actually, how, um, how much access that the Japanese got uh, to like look at factories and, and, and all that kind of stuff um, just by flashing their checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll really stress that the U.S. machine tools were the real prize. Uh, the Japanese threw just absurd amounts of cash to get as many as they could, uh, millions of dollars, which, of course, in 1937, 38, money is a lot. Yeah, I mean, you're talking like battle, like build a spare battleship for that money. Yeah, um, and particularly under a 1938 mission for, uh, under Colonel Kanada Minoru. Uh, of course, an abundance of those tools was part of what made U.S. production overwhelming. Uh, what the Japanese had to do by hand or with a handful of machines that they that could bottleneck production, the U.S. could do on a massive scale. So if you've got one, it doesn't matter how efficient your production line is before or after your one widget machine um, has to process everything coming into it and then send everything out after. <laughs> um, yeah. And that's a, that's, a, that's a situation that the Japanese aviation industry would find itself in because they were so dependent on, on foreign machine tools, particularly American. So this is stuff like, you know, uh, presses and uh, mach uh, machines that can tool crankshafts for engines, et cetera. Mm, yeah, it's 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 the kind of the the unique, the unique heavy industry that only really has any application to to a particular type of production. That mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's not the kind of stuff where you can immediately repurpose. It's like oh yes, of course. Well, this other industry will have a press that does this. It's like no, you 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 don't need a press of that capability and that particular size and shape of material for anything else but this, which means you can 
you, you're going to have your limits when it comes to that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, as a random aside, American assessments of like the Japanese aviation industry largely were actually very accurate because they were they would tour Japanese factories and all that, and they're like they have nowhere near enough machine tools, and then all most of their machine tools are American, uh, which is part of the uh, part of the logic when they started uh, embargoing certain things um, or certain. Uh, when they started putting the embargo in place against Japan and they would start restricting certain materials, this is why. Uh, for example, I think it was in 1939 that they finally cut off. Um, so the Japanese were just on this buying spree of like machine tools and all that. And then finally somebody in the US figured out, hey, maybe we shouldn't be doing this um, and put a stop to it. So I described those instances because they're the only exceptionally tenuous links to this weird Japanese Air Force general story. And again, there's zero evidence connecting these two things. This is firmly in tinfoil hat conspiracy speculation territory because the information provided by the PR guy, the US PR guy, doesn't provide any actual details around the claim. Uh, not even a year that it took place. So I can't confirm anything that he said. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually just trying to think. I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think Japan has ever had a Japanese Air Force. It would have been the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service, the Imperial Japanese mm -hmm. Army Air Service, and then mm -hmm. afterwards it would have been, the, what, the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force, I think is what yep. they're called now? Yep. So, so there's they, never actually been a Japanese Air Force, let alone a general of one. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, they, there, there's no way that... There, there was some vague in, um, talk of trying to confine air forces in the mid-1930s, but it was dead on arrival. Like, they'd just be like, nope. Because, of course, the Navy and the Army are not going to give up their, um, their respective pet projects and then combine it together into another service um, <laughs> that could threaten their power politically. Well, yeah, and I suppose <laughs> at, at that point, by the 50s, they would have had a, a chance to look back at things like what happened to the Fleet Air Arm in the 1920s and <laughs> 1930s. It's like, yes, maybe having a competitive service for the for aircraft is not such a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess this leads to the point I'll end on. Um, all of this wild speculation and conspiracy around the Zero being a copy overshadows a far more important point. Um, so in the words of one histor Japanese historian of the Zero, the decisive factors behind the plane's performance were outstanding airframe design, which was wholly Japanese, but then a Hamilton standard variable pitch constant speed propeller that was produced under license. So the original Japanese prototype had a, a worse propeller. I mean, propellers are... This is not something often talked about because people are talking about engines and, and all this stuff, but mm -hmm. color's really important. Um, and I guess a similar story, I guess, in uh, the development of naval technology as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the, the Hamilton standard propeller that, they was, that was put on the Zero actually improved the performance quite significantly. Uh, Japan produced a number of specific foreign components under license, and that was hardly unique to the Japanese, but I mean, they made good use of Hamilton standard propellers, Orlick and Cannons, Browning and Vickers MGs, Sperry automatic pilot, German DB, uh, DB601 engines. Yeah, and, and, le and, less, less, and more questionably less uh, auspicious performance of ex-French ex 25mm anti-aircraft cannon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, many Japanese aircraft components were produced with U.S. machine tools purchased before the war, or at, at times in factories based on U.S. layouts. So, for example, uh, Pratt & Whitney's engine factory at East Hartford, Connecticut, and uh, Connecticut, I should say, and um, Mitsubishi's number four engine works in Nagoya. Um, they have very similar layouts. Uh, this was combined with plenty of Japanese innovation, because, you know, an automatic pilot or a single component within an engine wasn't an entire plane. Um, yeah. However, even during the war, the Americans would start pulling apart Japanese planes and they would see Sperry automatic pilots, Hamilton standard propellers, uh, a component within an engine based on something from Pratt and Whitney. And then they would just slap the, dis the derisive copy label on it. And that implied a legality for one thing, which in almost all cases was not true. The Japanese had legally purchased the production licenses for various components during the war. In fact, the, the cases of the Japanese actually illicitly copying something is are very small. For the most part, they would legally purchase the production rights. Okay. Um, it was also often expanded beyond reality. So they would see one component that was a Pratt and Whitney, and then they would assume that the whole engine was a knockoff. Um, all through the war, the Americans were very quick to use very reductive or dismissive language, implying things were somehow derived from a Western source, often American, because that's what 
you know, they're mirror imaging. They're thinking, well, well who are the Japanese going to copy? Well, naturally, the most brilliant people in the universe, Americans. <laughs> yeah. um, so, for example, um, an early report looking at the Zero Sake A12 engine immediately labeled it as almost identical design Pratt Whitney R1535. And then the report constantly used language stressing that it was basically the same. Um, in fact, the Sake A12 was actually, it was in the same category of small 14 cylinder radial engine as that Pratt and Whitney. But the Sake series engines were a Japanese design that had been developed uh, years before based on careful study of a French known Rhone 14M and a Bristol Mercury paired with Nakajima's own experience. So it was a copy of nothing, but they'd studied a French and British engine and then paired that with their own experience and then designed their own engine. But then the Americans said it was actually close to a Pratt and Whitney. Um, so keep in mind that this is during the war when they literally had an example sitting in front of them that they could pull apart and look at. Um, this whole saga is a very good example of what historians do. They, they critically assess and weigh the available evidence from a number of sources and then build an understanding of historical events based on that analysis. Uh, the overwhelming body of evidence is against any notion that the Zero was a foreign cop. Um, and again, as historians, I mean, if more evidence came to light, like somebody's digging through Mitsubishi Heavy Industries and they find a filing cabinet full of things we have copied and there's all those like mm -hmm. blueprints and uh, uh, damning information, we'll have to revise that. But at this point, and I mean, it's we're getting to the point now where it's pretty unlikely that something like that is going to come to light. So yeah, um, at the moment, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I'll, I guess I'll conclude. And once again, thank uh, Kaz for providing some Japanese sourcing. All right. Well, that was a, that was a very interesting um, bit of information to to understand. And yeah, I think it's it's one of these things where we have to be very careful because um, much as obviously it, it it touches partially i suppose maybe on modern po political things which we try to avoid but the the simple fact of the matter is that going through all of this i'm struck by the fact that let's say if we take the zero as an i as a concept as a radial engine monoplane fighter there were a lot of radial engine monoplane fighters in world war ii um from pretty much every side but you don't see somebody going around saying that, say, the the radial engine version of the Tempest was a copy of the Focke-Wulf 190 or, or other similar things, or people looking at, say, a Hurricane and a Spitfire and saying, well, clearly Supermarines copied Hawker um, <laughs> and, and so on and so forth. It's like, and, and, and no one accuses the P-51 of being a derivative of the Spitfire, despite the fact they, sh they literally share a Merlin engine. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and that is literally a case of a, a, the Packard Merlin is, a, is an American copy of a of a Rolls Royce. Um, so we do have to be very careful when it comes to nations that we're not quite so familiar with, being most of us Western his, Western based, that we don't just automatically assume, as people obviously in the past have done, that just because they're not part of our technological development tree that they must therefore automatically want to copy us mm -hmm. because let's face it at the end of the day there was only one nation that built an 18 inch gun armed battleship and that and that was japan <laughs> 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 they're also the, they were also the first people to put in the uh the oxygen fuel uh torpedoes with the long lances so that you you can't point to anything from Britain, America, Japan, or Italy, and say, oh, yes, well, the, the Yamato was clearly copied from this. Um, about the closest you can, if you really want to go conspiratorial, you can maybe point to the, the heavyweight torpedoes on the Nelsons and go, oh, the long lance may be based on that. But even then, it's different caliber, different explosives, different range capabilities. And although the Nelson torpedoes use oxygen enhancement, they're not. This, it's not the same as the long lance. So... Yeah, we 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 always have to be careful when when we're looking at these kind of scenarios of don't just assume that because they are other they must somehow therefore be inferior because well one it's bad history and and two um it's a very good way if you if you end up in charge of anything militarily speaking it's a very good way of getting your own men killed by assuming that the uh, the other side can't possibly be match you. Yes, um and I I guess like one final little point is that when when you jump to the conclusion that something is a copy, I mean, 
these things are designed by specific nations for specific reasons. I mean, the V143 did not have the operational range of a zero. The, the Gloucester did not have the operational range of a zero because when they those design specifications for those aircraft were laid out, the British didn't need something that would fly you know across Europe and back. They wanted very specific things at that time. Um, so to say something is a copy, it's like why would they copy a, a race a civilian racing aircraft from the mid 1930s as a as a long range strategic escort and carrier fighter? Like there's it, it's like when you sit down and just think about it briefly, um, it, it starts to unravel. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was, that was all very, very interesting. Thank you once again for lending your expertise to the channel. Uh, and pleasure is always talking to you as well. Yeah, so I'm always happy to be here. And uh, yeah, hopefully everyone in, enjoyed that. And we will, at some point, um, when the scheduling and listing allows, we at some point we will be revisiting the Pacific Theatre uh, with Justin, although I suspect that uh, unless more people pour into the comments with further questions about the Zero, the next one will be uh, a little bit more uh, sea level based. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, yes, I, I, to, to answer the inevitable questions I'm sure we're going to see in the comments, if somebody somehow manages to shanghai or force me into uh watching dash reviewing midway i'm afraid justin you will have to suffer alongside me for that <laughs> one. all right <laughs> uh, all right then okay well thank you very much everyone for listening and uh see you again in another video that's it for this video thanks for watching if you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review let us know in the comments below don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.